Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books in African American Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Adam McNeil. On today's podcast, I'm interviewing Dr. E. James West, author of Ebony Magazine and Lerone Bennett Jr., Popular Black History and Post-War America. In this interview, you'll find out why Dr. Perro Dagbovi described Ebony Magazine and Lerone Bennett Jr. as a major contribution to our understanding of what West aptly calls popular Black history. Enjoy the interview, y'all. Welcome to the podcast, James. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing okay. How you doing today, Adam? Man, happy to be here. And, you know, it's Monday. Well, morning for me, afternoon for you. Uh, So, you know, just excited for this uh, interview. And uh, shout out to Marshall Poe for bringing us together. Uh, He he was the one who was like, hey, man, James got a book out. I think you you should be the guy, you know, a little longer than what he probably expected. But, hey, we're we're here regardless, man. And so, um, James, really happy to be here to talk about Ebony Magazine and Lerone Bennett Jr., Popular Black History and Post-War America. So tell us how you got to this project. How did how did you find Lerone Bennett or how did he find you? Sure. Um, so I think my entry point was, was Ebony Magazine, um, who, you know, most listeners probably have some idea of Ebony Magazine, a popular black consumer magazine um we can talk a bit more about its its history um but when i started my undergraduate which was 2008 in the uk um that was around the time that johnson publishing which is the company that had published ebony um entered a agreement with google to digitize a lot of its back catalog so a lot of ebony suddenly became very available um through google books so it was something I first encountered as, as an undergraduate. I found it quite useful um, and a quite interesting window into thinking about certain periods of African-American history post-1945. And then it was something that I kind of came back to at a doctoral level um, and um, started from just thinking about Ebony as a really interesting source, really, a kind of archive of, of 20th century black history. Uh, and then the more I looked at it, the more I was drawn to a lot of the historical content, which I found very interesting. And then, you know, when you look at that content, um, Lauren Bennett Jr. is the editor who is more often than not writing that material. So that was how I kind of became familiar with Bennett. And so with the actual project that you have with this amazing book that y'all, if if you've heard any of the kerfuffles about the 1619 project or, you know, you, you probably heard from... Nicole Hannah Jones that, you know, uh, before the Mayflower uh, was the book that really started her on her journey as a, as a youth um, to, to 2019 and beyond here in 2022. Um, I'm very interested to know about your work with this book. And, you know, I'm just, I'm, I know you've listened to a couple of interviews. And so I, I love to ask this question. What was the stiffest challenge that you encountered while researching, constructing and or writing? this book yes yeah, it's, it's a great question um i think well the, the primary concern or, or challenge or just something was always at the forefront of my mind i think is i'm a, I'm a white british scholar um so i'm coming at this really as a kind of from a contextual or cultural um outside um you know ebony is a magazine that i think has a lot of sentiment and a lot of influence a lot of people feel a lot some kind of way about it and i didn't really have a lot of that context um so for me it was one of the most challenging things was just being mindful of that and just you know trying to develop that broader understanding of the ways in which ebony function um because it has a lot of different roles as a publication um And yeah, for people who are not familiar with Ebony, it started in 1945, a guy called John Hayes Johnson, Johnson, publishing out of Chicago. And at the at the peak of its influence, um, when you account for things like pass on circulation and just general um, market saturation, it's it's hitting about four in every 10 adult black Americans. So it's got a pretty extraordinary reach. Um, And it's a very diverse publication. It's it's 
generally speaking, it's a quite moderate um, consumerist aspirational magazine. Um, but then within that, you have a lot of space for different perspectives. Um, and this was something that I was not really familiar with, um, certainly prior to starting my PhD. So that was something that just gaining a more nuanced understanding of how Ebony worked um, was a big part of that. And then in terms of Bennett specifically, um, you know, I've, I never met Bennett prior to his passing. Um, so he, he passed away in, in 2018, I believe. Um, and he, he had health concerns towards the end of his life. And there was a couple of times where uh, I, we were potentially going to meet and then um, it didn't happen. Um, so that's always just a challenge when there is a figure who's quite central to your project um, and you never actually meet that person. Um, and again, that kind of just exacerbated or added to those initial challenges in terms of being, you know, a white scholar who's not based in the US, um, who doesn't have that kind of cultural engagement with Ebony. You know, Ebony is not a magazine that's in my household growing up. Ebony is not a magazine that my family read or my parents read, you know, all of that um, background, that, that milieu into which the, the specific histories that I talk about in this book um, enter. So. Yeah, th those things were probably the the biggest challenges um, on a, on a personal level. And so, with that being said, how did you ultimately um, try to bridge um, that divide with your with your uh, research and methodological strategies? Yeah, I think um, a big part of it was relying on the expertise and, and help of or the people of other institutions. So particularly in Chicago, I've been very fortunate to have um, support from the Black Metropolis uh, Research Consortium, which is a group, it's, it's based at the University of Chicago. Um, if anyone's unfamiliar, I, I recommend, you know, you give a Google, it's a, the BMRC is a really fantastic um, organization and, and it's a basically a collective of different archives, libraries um, within Chicago. So that runs from quite, big institutions like the Newbury Library or University of Chicago to um, more neighborhood institutions um, like uh, Shorefront, um, I believe it's called the Shorefront Legacy Project is is, is one. Um, and then, you know, institutions like um, Theasta Gates's Arts Bank on the South Side. So, it, it, you know, they cover a, um, a wide range of, of perspectives, but um, most of the BMRC is, is organized around, you know, raising awareness of engaging with archives and histories of Black Chicago. Um, so I, I've ha I got three uh, BMRC fellowships um, in, in three different summers, and that played a really massive role in um, giving me access to certain collections, particularly at Chicago History Museum, um, and then also at Chicago State University. Those were two of the, the most important Chicago-based collections for me. Um, and then Emory University has some of Bennett's papers as well. Um, so Randall Burkett um, at Emory was a fantastic help. And then Pella McDaniels, who sadly passed away uh, not too long ago. Um, but they were really instrumental in getting access to Bennett's papers at Emory. Um, and then, yeah, I can, I can talk a bit more about those archival collections specifically. I think the Chicago State stuff uh, has a really please quite, do please yeah. do yeah so, and, 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 and and thank you for bringing up um the late uh pelham mcdaniels um a good a good friend and mentor uh carl sudler and the folks down um at emory university are doing uh great by his legacy um they just had the uh most recent uh pelham mcdaniels uh conversation lecture um i think a couple weeks ago um and so you know just seeing that and, and i didn't even know about him um, honestly, until um, the the very end, and so uh, to to learn about him also being a part of your project and and this book, which um, got Perro Dagbovi to say E. James West's book is the first major examination of Ebony as a forum for Black historical discourse, and the magazine's longtime executive editor Lerone Benin Jr.'s multifaceted thought work and scholarship as a leading popular historian of the Black past and vital contributor to the post-war Black history movement, a well-researched and accessible study situated within the growing field of Black intellectual history. 
Ebony Magazine and Lerone Bedding Jr. is a major contribution to our understanding of, of what Wes aptly calls black uh, popular black history. Now, that's a that's a big that's a big dude saying saying that about your book, my friend. So 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 please, you know, expand a little more about uh, some of the uh, institutions, culture and otherwise, and also the people like Dagbovi, who pl- also played a major role in helping you get to the book, pub- the book publication and beyond. Yeah, it was it was great to have, have Perro blurb the book. And uh, yeah, I met him for the first time at Sala a couple of years ago, and it was that was, was nice to, to kind of see him. Oh, yeah. Person. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's I think he's at this point, he's one of the, the guys at Asala who just kind of, you know, filters into like, exactly. everyone. Everyone knows Perro, so he just kind of filters yep. around. Yeah, um, definitely. But yeah, I think, again, it goes back to, you know, I was, I was, you know I'm, a, I'm a white British guy. I don't have a lot of the context for this, so I'm reliant on. Um, you know the, the generosity and, and knowledge of other people um, within Chicago. Um, you know I've been lucky to have support from again. You know someone who recently passed Tim Black, um, who's you know just like this kind of griot, this fountain of knowledge of, of Black Chicago, and um, yeah, also on an institutional level. Um, you know the institutions I already mentioned: um, Aisha Heichel, who's now at the Avery uh, Center in Charleston, and then Raquel Flores Clemens in particular, who. Um, was at Chicago State they were you know so instrumental in, in getting access to collection um because yeah Bennett Chicago State came into a huge collection of Bennett's material in um, a kind of very unexpected way and I happened to be in Chicago at the moment that that happened um so Beautiful. it was yeah um Aisha could talk to me about it and I kind of lost my mind because they just had all of this un- like unprocessed material um that I was able to to dive into um, which was which was you know so important for the project, um, but yeah, I think that it's probably we should probably talk a little bit more about that just because I think it's also please useful. do yeah, yeah. No, the airwaves are yours, my friend. Well, it's it's kind of a, a bit of a crazy story, but also it's just so instructive in thinking about you know whose history is valued and often mm-hmm. you know the kind of histories mm-hmm. that get lost because mm-hmm. for Bennett, I mean Bennett is you know he he is a one of the leading public or popular historians of the 20th century um you know he's a really influential editor at at ebony magazine um basically his entire office in the old johnson publishing building in chicago was put into storage after that building was sold to columbia college chicago uh in about 2010 and because of his health concerns um and other issues complicating factors the storage locker in which a lot of this stuff was kept um, I believe that the payment on the storage locker lapsed. So all of this material, all, all of this incredible um, material oh, out of what? Bennett's collection was just going to get thrown away. Oh, shit. Um, and at the very last minute, I, I think it was one of the guys who was from the storage company who was like moving the stuff. And it was just it was just going to get chucked, is my understanding. Um, he recognized Bennett's name. And then he was like, oh, uh, I, you know, who, what, who should I call about this? So he called Chicago State um, and got in contact with Aisha, who was at Chicago State. And then um, they, the collection ended up going to Chicago State. Um, but, you know, that would just soak easily all of this material. And, you know, when, when I got there, it was, you're talking about like 120, 140 moving boxes of material. So it's an, you know, it's an incredibly large collection. Um, and that all of that material could so easily have just have just been thrown away, and it's just obviously it's it's very fortunate that it was recovered and, and and by Chicago State, and it's extremely fortunate for me that I happened to be in Chicago at the exact moment that this was happening, and then I could kind of get my eyes on the, on this material. But you know, the, these type of stories just happen all the time when we talk about African American history and and Black diasporic history, and it's you know it's not a coincidence that these type of stories keep happening. You know, you you. You, there's so many of these fascinating characters and institutions and then you think oh i'd love to find out more about these while the archival collections and they just don't exist um because they've been disregarded or they haven't been valued um and you know that speaks to the ways in which archives value material it speaks to the way in, in which our society values material it speaks to the ways in which you know whose histories get to be told and whose histories don't um and that's incredibly sad but but you know in this particular instance it was it was fortunate that 
that this huge collection of, of Bennett's material was um, ultimately um, able to be to be saved. And, and Chicago State has just recently finished processing um, that material, and I, I believe now it's accessible to the public. Wow! And twelve years later, it's like you could you could you have written this book if if you it, could you have written this particular book had um had that storage space been you know pretty much just given away or whatever the next step would have been if that uh unknown name person or unnamed person didn't call chicago state up um i don't think so like not in the form that it is um yeah. i could have written you know a book and then it would have been a a feature of that book and it maybe would have asked slightly different questions but um yeah like so much of that material was was so important to to this project and, and also um like other projects that i've done like i recently finished a biography of bennett and it was you know really central to to that project as well um but yeah as, as i say you know that, that's not a new um or particularly unusual story in case of the fragility or precarity of so many of these these archives mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so I'm interested to know as someone who has now written a full book that I have my left hand on and a proof a proof version of a uh, biography, um, what do you think made Lerone Bennett Jr. such a singular figure as a Black historian and writer? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a difficult question in some ways because I think Bennett is someone who resonates with a lot of people but it's quite an intimate relationship with people and people you know he wrote on a diverse range of material and he wrote you know he wrote very eloquently and evocatively about different things so you know some people their point of perspective with with Bennett is is before the Mayflower which uh, came out in the early 60s and you know remains a one of the you know landmark survey black history texts of the the 20th century um, probably up there with um, John Hope Franklin's from from slavery to freedom um, in terms of copies sold and you know the number of issues it went through and things like that. Um, some people come to Bennett through his work on Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so he has you know this this very controversial article in the late sixties about a, a Lincoln being a white supremacist and that, that article a couple of decades very later feeds into controversial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that feeds into forced into glory, which. Uh, he, Bennett understands as his magnum opus, which which comes out um, in two thousand um, or, or around two thousand, um, and then other people, you know, come at him from from other perspectives. You know, he he writes on all, all matter of different things. Um, I think I think for Bennett, his own understanding of the way that his position as a popular historian worked um, was Bennett. <laughs> was able to strategically utilize his position at Ebony um, and at Johnson Publishing, you know, the the largest black publishing enterprise in, in the company, in the country and arguably the world. Um, and that provided him with an enormous platform and a reach. And he was able to strategically utilize that um, to disseminate his ideas about black history. Um, and also, I think Bennett was very intentional in how he wrote. So I think that Bennett, and this is maybe something that separates him from some of the black public intellectuals that we maybe think about who emerged during potentially the 1990s or the 2000s. I think Bennett, you know, Bennett's core audience and his imagined audience and his desired audience was black people. And I don't think that he was that concerned with being, you know, the, the Adolf Reed interpretation of the black public intellectual where you're almost a cipher or like a translator of black culture for, for white people. Like Bennett didn't really care about that. You know, he cared about writing for black people and that was the audience that he was looking for. Um, and I think that resonated with a lot of that audience because the way that he wrote history wasn't beholden to certain, you know, he, he talked a lot about trying to write outside the conceptual envelope of white history and, you know, we can give specific examples of, of what he meant by that. But I think that overarching idea of, of trying to write history from a black perspective um, for Bennett was a guiding principle. And I think that's something that resonated with a tremendous number of readers um, and, you know, resonated in different ways. But I think that was, you know, the basis of his appeal. And and it's it's interesting. I don't I don't think that you did this on purpose, but it was very interesting when you just said from a black perspective and 
who you know the African American Intellectual History Society's uh, uh, main uh, arm is their blog called Black Perspectives, and I should say ours since I am on the executive board. Uh, for 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 those who may not know, um, so it's just very interesting. Also, because I think what you just said um, it was an interesting sleight of hand, but it was like, what does it mean to have a blog? You know, and this you know not going to get all the way into it on the public airwaves per se, but um, as a, as an appetizer is more so just made me think recently about what does it mean in terms of having a blog for an arm of an organization that name is black perspectives. And as you just talked about Bennett's main focus in terms of uh, the, the, the group that he was writing for are black folks, right? So he's writing from, um, his interpretation of a black perspective. Um, so, so that that's just been. Um, I know that that's been something that um, folks have thought about and talked about at times about um, AIHS's space. Um, but what you just said made it brought it to my attention for this particular book. So, uh, for those who are listening, you, you know, hit my DMs if you have questions. But uh, yeah, that that's definitely been something that I've thought about too. Uh, but but yeah, sorry, I, that was just a a, a riff <laughs> that, that I just had, my friend. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. I think that um, the first thing that I wrote for Black Perspectives and was a a, a bit tree of of Bennett. Um, oh really? Yeah, in uh, okay, yeah. twenty eighteen, and that was I think I I wrote that. Um, and uh, and then I kind of became a more semi regular um, mm-hmm. contributor to Black Perspectives, but yeah, it's it's kind of it ties back again. You know, Benny was the entry point for a uh, for writing for Black Perspectives, and I I think yeah, I think that's something that I've become more and more like I think I've thought about that more and more as I've worked through the pro like this book, and then also the the biography of Bennett that I've been working on more recently, um, and yeah, what exactly. Because, it, you know, that kind of thing sounds quite nice if it's like, oh, black people, like Bennett wrote for black people from a black perspective, but in some ways that's quite essentialist. So what exactly did that mean? Like, what did that mean for Bennett specifically? Right, um, right. And that's been something that I've, I've been thinking a lot about. Um, yeah, particularly over the last couple of years, for sure. Yeah. And would you describe yourself as a historian of black intellectual history? Just as I, just a, a, a thought that I just had. Um, like, I think, I think I probably would. Um, but it's, again, it's just, I'm just like, not to get too all up in my feelings on, on the podcast, but hey, I man, think it's look, just, look, come on, yeah, <laughs> like you, you just, if you're a white scholar of the experience of kind of a minoritized group of people or a disenfranchised group of people, and in this case, the specific example we're talking about is black history or, or African-American history there is always like you can't avoid there being a kind of extractive component to the work that you do um and i think for a lot of white scholars that extractive element is the thing that they're probably more interested in than necessarily kind of you know a lot of white scholars i think are more interested in tech than the liberation of black people so uh, you know th- that I, I don't think it's possible to get away from like some element of that work being extractive from the position of writing as a white scholar. And I think that that doesn't negate the potential value of the work that I might bring to this field as a white scholar, but it's something that you are just constantly having to grapple with and be mindful of and just be thinking, you know, who is this work benefiting? Um, Cause if this work is benefiting me in a predominantly white academic environment, then that's not really a reason to be doing this work. So, yeah, I think I would, I, you know, I, I would say that I'm a historian of, of black intellectual history, but that's also something that I would kind of struggle with a little bit and, and be thinking about, you know, what gives me the right or the confidence to kind of ascribe that label to myself. And, you know, um, so, yeah, I saw, it's just, yeah, it's always something that's kind of, yeah. Yeah, no, my mind, I think. No, yeah, no, and and it's something that um part of the reason why I ask is because I know that there have been um instances on Twitter where there have been conversations about Black Studies, 
Um, and I think you've even published some stuff in um, some pieces in um, The Black Scholar, um, if I'm not mistaken. And so it's just, you know, a question that, um, you know, I, I was very interested in, especially with um, the kind of work that um, your your book here is doing and also how folks like Dagbovi uh, Dagbovi also describe it. So I'm just interested in what you actually think as the writer of uh, of the story here. Um, and speaking of kind of writers of stories and crafters of stories, uh, Johnson Publishing. We can't talk about Lauren Bennett Jr. without also talking about um, Johnson Publishing. And so can you discuss the and, and really describe the role Johnson Publishing had in helping build Lauren Bennett's uh, public profile? Yeah, sure. So Johnson Publishing starts, it, it's, it's first called Negro Digest Publishing and then changes its name. Um, so his first publication is Negro Digest in 1942. Um, then Ebony starts in 1945 and Ebony really changes the game because uh, Ebony is the first black consumer magazine, photo editorial magazine to have sustained success. Um, it's the first black publication to really cross the color line in terms of advertising revenues. Um, and that enables publisher John Hayes Johnson to to build this really quite spectacular roster of, of black literary talent in Chicago um, during during the late 40s into, into the 50s. Uh, so Bennett joins the company in 1953 and he writes first for Jet Magazine, which is a uh, sister publication of Ebony. It's, it's quite a, it was quite a small magazine, um, a kind of news news magazine more than Ebony. And um, then after about a year, he moves to, to Ebony. And he joins the company at a really interesting moment in the company's history. So for people who aren't familiar, um, the early history of, of Johnson Publishing, um, the, the editorial control was mainly a guy called Ben Burns, who was a white Jewish editor who, you know, was a like, lapsed Communist Party member. And then he aligned with Johnson and they built this quite successful partnership. Um, in the 40s and early 50s. But the, the magazine's content in this period, I guess you might describe it as, as cheesecake or very light touch. Um, there was, you know, lots of um, semi-nude models, lots of stories on interracial passing. Um, it was it was quite titillating. Um, they were going for a certain type of audience. And then into the 50s, that begins to change in, in large part because readers are demanding more coverage of the civil rights movement, which is kind of emerging as a national force. And then, you know, people are more interested in stories about black history, about more, you know, quote unquote, serious aspects of, of black life. So Bennett joins at this moment where Johnson Publishing as a company and Ebony in particular, it, 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 the identity is kind of shifting. And Ben Burns, the, the white editor, is removed um, around the time that uh, Bennett joins the company. Um, so Johnson, the publisher, is kind of looking for people to take the magazine forward in, in new ways. Um, and he ultimately decides that Bennett is the person to author this pioneering Black History series that appears in Ebony um, during the early 60s. And then the success of that series gets translated into Before the Mayflower, uh, which is Bennett's first book length work. And, and that's really a book length version of the Black History series that he does for Ebony. And that really gives him the platform. Because um, prior to this, you know, Bennett is relatively well known. He's come from the Atlanta Daily World. He's, he's a quite talented journalist. He's, he's like respected within the black press as a talented journalist, but he's not seen as a historian, really. Like people don't recognize him to be a historian. Um, whereas before the Mayflower, the success of that just goes far beyond what Bennett or Johnson could possibly have imagined. And that really positions him suddenly and quite dramatically as this new authority on black history um, who has this enormous audience through Ebony magazine. Um, so it's a quite rapid emergence for Bennett, um, at least in being seen as a historian. And so with that context, can you then describe the tensions that at different times um, develop between the public persona of Ebony as this black consumer magazine and the conflicts it creates at times for 
a more militant figure and not even more militant, depending on the time, very militant uh, figure, really all militant at the time um, of a figure like Bennett Jr. Um, Because I I think that's a central um, of the many central themes of your book. That is one of the ones that I I realized very quickly. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I, I think Bennett is part of a, a more left wing block within Johnson publishing um, particularly during the 1960s. So a few other people, you know, Jonathan Fenderson has written a really fantastic book about Hoyt Fuller um, building the black arts movement. So Hoyt Fuller, who was, he was at Johnson Publishing and then in the 50s, and then he left because he was alienated by the editorial politics. And then Johnson convinces him to come back uh, to edit Negro Digest, which was revived in the early 60s with Hoyt Fuller as the editor. Hoyt Fuller is, is one part of that left-wing bloc, someone like David Lawrence, who joins a little bit later in the 60s and has very strong links to Southern activism and um, groups like SNCC. Um, He's another part of that bloc. And a lot of these guys have a lot of problems with the way that Johnson runs the company, in particular, his deference to corporate advertisers, um, you know, his reluctance to publish, you know, more militant content um, or more critically engaged content more sympathetic profiles of emerging uh, black leaders such as Stokely Carmichael, uh, Kami Tore, um, people like Eldridge Cleaver, you know, those kind of characters. And this is Bennett, for, for Bennett, this is something that he grapples with a lot throughout his entire time at Johnson Publishing. And he's obviously able to reconcile it to some extent because he never really leaves Johnson Publishing from, you know, the early 50s through to when he retires. Um, in the early 21st century but you see it in his papers you see it in his correspondence with other people like he he really struggles with how to do the most good in his role because he he understands that he has this incredible platform and he can use that to disseminate his ideas about black history to the largest possible group of people um but he also understands that his reputation offers johnson something of a shield um you know, it it kind of helps, um, it helps Johnson get away from some of the more public critiques of his enterprise and of Ebony Magazine in particular. Um, And yeah, for for Bennett, the way that he rationalizes, which is a way that I think is quite interesting because he's quite critical of the magazine's consumerist orientation, but also he uses that lens to understand his own position within the company. And he describes himself as a franchise so, yeah, he sees himself as a franchise within Johnson Publishing. Um, so he almost separates the specific work that he does from the broader remit or politics of Johnson Publishing or of Ebony Magazine. And I think that's the way that he you know, reconciles himself to his specific role. And speaking of specific roles, one of the aspects that is obviously very important, and this goes back to um, Dag Bovey saying, that this, uh, that Ebony Magazine and Lerone Bennett Jr. is a major contribution to our understanding of what West aptly calls popular Black history. And so with that popular Black history framing, can you then speak about how the historical establishment at large, especially in the 60s and 70s and moving forward in, towards the end of the century, how did the historical establishment engage um, Bennett junior as a popular historian right because sometimes when you think of popular historian phd especially in this time where the institutionalization and the growing number of black phds in history or are, are, and uh, the early black study spaces are growing how did folks especially the white ones um engage um Lerone bennett jr as a popular historian yeah that's a great question i think i think it's probably easiest if we distinguish between I guess you know the white academy or or white professional historians who are broadly critical like broadly they have negative opinions about Bennett Um, and you see that in framings of his work which are either quite dismissive or they say oh he doesn't really understand the theory of history Um, you know his 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 simplistic takes you know he, he writes like a journalist you see all these quite subtle criticisms and then less subtle criticisms um, at certain points, particularly after his work on Abraham Lincoln comes out. Um, 
for black historians and particularly black historians within the academy i think the the relationship is more complex um and i think a good example is someone like john hope franklin who is again within the chicago environment in which bennett is is moving and they have you know a pretty good personal relationship from the best that i can understand from from bennett's papers and, and talking with members of his family and, and colleagues and things like that so franklin and, and bennett you know they they appear at conferences together they appear on radio shows together um, they have a you know a, a clear respect for one another um, but i also think that there is a little bit of tension there because John Hope Franklin, and you know, some people might disagree with disagree with my take on this, but I would see John Hope Franklin as someone who primarily understands his role in the academy to be that of a Southern historian, um, and certainly that's the way that he approaches his role at the University of Chicago. Um, that's my understanding of, of Franklin's work. Whereas Bennett is someone who, you know, his approach to history comes through through a different lens and a different perspective. Um, that's not to say that they obviously share, you know, similar similarities of experience in, in some ways. But um, yeah, I th- the, the biggest allies that Bennett has within the academy are black historians who are either more closely associated with this emerging group of, um, you know, some people describe them as black how- black power historians during the late sixties, early seventies. So people like Vincent Harding, Vincent Harding absolutely adores Lorraine Bennett and they have a really, you know, great relationship and they connect through things such as the Institute of the Black World in Atlanta. Um, And then also scholars who, you know, are really pioneers in the emergence of Africana studies or African-American studies. You know, people like John Hope Franklin um, are broadly very supportive of of Bennett's work. Um, But yeah, it's, it's an interesting mix. Um, and I think you can probably see that in the tensions that emerge around black studies as a discipline as well during this period. Um, cause broadly speaking, you see scholars separating into camps of seeing black studies as a more radical discipline. And then the idea of academic black studies, which is more or less integrate black perspectives into the existing framework of the academy. Um, and Bennett, you know, is very much more arguing for a, a more radical interpretation of black studies, I think. Um, and that, yeah, that shapes his relationship with with uh, black historians during that period in, in other ways. And you talk about the Institute of the Black World and, you know, shout out to Derek White for his great book that, um, you know, I'm really excited to, to dig into. Um, so can you actually discuss a, a little more about um, Bennett Jr.'s relationship to black studies? along with his connection to the Institute of the Black World, because it brings that part of the book really brings out so many different figures. Where I was like, damn, I, I, ain't, I ain't realize all of this. Yeah, I think, yeah, Derek White's book is, is fantastic, The Challenge of Blackness. And he actually takes the title of that book from a speech that Bennett gives for the Institute of the Black World, which Vincent Harding later describes as, you know, kind of an encapsulation of the, the core principles of the Institute. Um, so yeah, so Bennett is involved with the Institute of the Black World. His his entry into, I guess, a more academic role, if you like, is he's invited to Northwestern University in the late 1960s um, as a visiting professor. So the faculty at Northwestern, this is in the aftermath of uh, student protests and occupations at Northwestern. Um, and Northwestern's administration is kind of scrambling and they're, they're looking for people who they can invite to kind of address some of these student concerns and, and Bennett emerges as a consensus candidate. Um, so he he comes to Northwestern for a year um, and he teaches and, you know, the students love him. It, is, it's, it goes very well. Um, and then a couple of years later, he's actually appointed to be the founding chair of Northwestern's African-American studies department in the early 70s. Um, and he doesn't, it doesn't last, that relationship doesn't last very long and it, it doesn't end particularly well. But um, I think, you know, it's important to, understand that connection for Bennett within this broader milieu of, you know, black journalists or black activists or or black popular historians, if you like, being invited into more formal positions within the academy. Um, So you see people like uh, Don Lee, um, who's subsequently known as as Haki Madabuti. Um, He is invited to, I believe, Cornell. He becomes a faculty at Cornell. You see people like Cleveland Sellers, 
Um, so, you know, you have this group of quite activist oriented um, scholars, artists who become faculty um, at different institutions and, and often it's at predominantly white institutions. Um, and then this creates tensions because often these people have a quite specific understanding of what black studies is and who black studies is for. And that doesn't necessarily align with the predominantly white administrations at places like Northwestern or Cornell or Columbia. Um, so yeah, it's uh, kind of another space in which Bennett's position as a historian is, is challenged or critiqued or discussed. And the Institute of the Black World is to me one of my favorite, like, and I'll say favorite because I'm, like I said, I'm looking forward to reading um, Derek White's book. I definitely got it downloaded and excited to to get it. And I need to buy the in uh, the physical copy too, um, because when we think about institutes and especially now um, in the in the world in which the deaths and the murders of folks in, you know, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Call the Roll, um, opened up institutional space across the academy and across corporate America and across the world, actually, really. Um, it makes you think about the relationship between Black death and, you know, institutionalization, shall we say. Um, and so it just made me think more about, you know, how you describe it, the Institute of the Black World's creation, its connection to Black studies, especially in this, like, really, really, really early period. And so um, it also connects to my next question in terms of periodization and also provenance, because Ebony Magazine and Lerone Benin Jr. makes an intriguing argument about the provenance of the term Black power. Can you discuss the? Uh, uh, can you discuss Lerone Bennett Jr.'s connection to Black Power and his connection to Kwame Ture, most known as the progenitor of the term Black Power? Because that, that part was like, okay, I ain't know that either. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, yeah, I think I'm. You know, in in this book, I'm not in any way making the case that Bennett, you know, invents the term Black Power or anything like that. Um, you know. Rhonda Williams and other scholars have done a fantastic job of showing the the prehistories of that term well prior to the sixties. But Bennett um, it, is is really interesting. About I think it's six months or so prior to the Meredith March, uh, which is when Quatre uh, Victoire then Stokely Carmichael really, you know, he has this this famous. Uh, speech and it's the first time that this term black power is picked up by national media outlets and that kind of launches the the idea of black power into the national stage you know six months or so prior to this Bennett had started a historical series in Ebony called Black Power um, and it was about reconstruction and it was about black political power during reconstruction um, and then that series continues and kind of runs alongside this emerging parallel dialogue around black power in the 1960s so Bennett's series I, th I think it's really interesting to read Bennett's series on black power in ebony alongside the emergence of black power um, during the months following the Meredith March um, and it's also interesting to me how mainstream media outlets basically ignore Bennett's series um, because what that series does is it really complicates the way that mainstream media are trying to frame black power. They're trying to frame it as a short termist reactionary, you know, angry, ill thought out response. Um, black power in the sixties is a short term manifestation of black rage, but Bennett's framing of that idea of black power is very clearly rooted in the reconstruction period. Um, and it gives a much long term or a more long term framing of the idea of black power in a way that definitely complicates those media narratives um, and the way that mainstream media outlets tried to frame black power in, you know, 66, 67. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it is an interesting series. And then that, that turns into a book called black power USA, which is about black power in, in reconstruction. Um, and Bennett and Kwame Torrey have a quite interesting relationship. You know, Bennett, 
pens one of the early in-depth profiles of of Touré in the aftermath of the Meredith March. Um, and again, you know, his understanding of Touré's relationship to black power is very much rooted in, rooted in black political power. And that's something that comes through in, you know, the Touré and Hamilton's book on black power. And then, you know, in subsequent years, um, Touré moves beyond that more politically specific framing of black power. But yeah, I think at this moment in 66, 67, uh, it is really interesting to see the way that Bennett is engaging with the idea of black power and the way he he's so clearly trying to frame it historically um, as almost a, a, re- a response to these short termist framings from from mainstream media. And so as we move towards the the final part of our interview, I'm really interested to know because you know once again going back to the framing of of, of popular historians and, and and not even just popular historians, put that to the side for a moment journalists that write history, I think is a more important framing for for today, Um, especially because you have uh, prominent journalists who write and and incorporate historical scholarship, like Nicole Hannah-Jones, previously mentioned, 1619 Project, Jamel Bowie, um, you know, who who was uh, developed through Slate and other spaces, Um, and actually had his own... um, American slavery series with uh, another, uh, you know, a, a white uh, a woman scholar, uh, Rebecca Onion, or a journalist, who I think actually got a PhD, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so, you know, journal, once again, people who describe themselves, I believe, as journalists who are writing history. And so maybe Onion to the side, but what similarities and differences do you find between Ben and Jr. and I described it at first as popular historians, but we'll reverse it to actually say journalists. Uh, because I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just interested to know what you see um, in, in the archival bits that you've gone through over the course of your career. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned uh, Rebecca Onion. She's just, she's editing something for Slate at the moment for me. It's oh, like, oh, oh, shit. Every, okay. Every, okay. Every, okay. Every oh, hey, 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 hey. You're trying to step on those toes, bro. I ain't trying to no, step no. on those toes, bro. Every, Everything's already connected. Um, yeah, no, it's just funny. Um, I think, yeah, I think for me, Bennett is part of this really strong tradition of black journalists and and, uh, and writing about history and, and that connection between black history and black journalism. And you you stretch that all the way back to people like, you know, George Washington Williams in, in the late 19th century. I mean, uh, his, his work on is often seen as one of the first survey studies of, of black history. Um, John Hope Franklin describes Washington's work as the, you know, the beginning of the first wave of, of, of black history, if you like. Um, but he's also someone who is an extremely influential journalist. You know, he does incredible investigative work in the Belgian Congo. Um, you know, people like Du Bois is as in many ways as as much a journalist as he is a sociologist or historian through his work with the crisis you know carter g woodson loves writing for the black press um and you know there's been some really great work on how carter g woodson as a journalist that how that work complemented his work as a historian um so bernice morris is uh, someone who, who's written a really great book about Carter car g woodson and, and the black press recently um so I see Bennett as very much being part of that tradition, like Joel Augustus Rogers is, is someone else in the Pittsburgh Courier. And, you know, the people that I've mentioned there, it you get a sense of how this framing is gendered. Um, and I think that is something that is an important consideration for Bennett. And it's definitely something that informs his work, um, because I do think the way it's to an extent, I think is changing in the present um, in the 21st century. But Certainly during this period, I think who gets to be a popular historian or who, or who gets to write in this way for, for a popular audience, um, I think it is quite a gendered project. Um, and that certainly limits the way that Bennett thinks about, you know, the connections between black history, black liberation. Um, and that is part of the milieu in which he's writing. Johnson Publishing in many ways is, is a quite you know gendered project. Um, it comes from his background. You know, he went to Morehouse College in Atlanta um, under the leadership of Benjamin Mays, um, where he's 
given a model of you know the Morehouse man, you know, a quite androcentric androcentric vision of of black excellence. Um, and you know, I guess in that feeds back to this question of, of pop, who's a popular historian or, or client journalist who gets to write about history. Um, and it also feeds back into ideas about you know respectability and, and race men. And I think Bennett, you can probably situate him within that lineage of of race men, although it, that's a term that he doesn't necessarily identify with himself. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely see him as being part of that project. And then, as you've already mentioned, it is interesting to see how scholars today, um, particularly scholars who or journalists who write for a public audience, um, you do see the influence of, of Bennett's writing um, on these type of projects. You know, the 1619 project, I think the very first footnote in the book version of the 1619 project is actually Bennett, um, which gives you yeah, a sense of that that influence or the, or the legacy of, of his writing. Um, and because so much of that, of that writing comes through Ebony, you know, one of the things I was trying to do with this book is really to think about the question, you know, what, what does it look like if we take Ebony seriously as a history text? Like, because the, you know, the readers are saying that they are valuing it in that way, you know, it's being interpreted in, in that way. So what does that mean if we, you know, take Ebony seriously um, as a source of, of history as, as a, as a part of, you know, what Vincent Harding describes as the modern black history revival. Um, and he did, he talks about Ebony as being a key driver as an engine for that revival. Um, so I think a lot of the book is really about addressing that question and it's doing it in different ways. And obviously Bennett is a central part of that. Um, but he's, he's not the only part of it for sure. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, in terms of the comparison, um, between, uh, Bennett Jr. And, you know, Bowie and, and Jones, uh, Hannah Jones and others is also just he uh, Ben and Jr. is writing within black institutional space. And they're not. And and that's no slight at them. But I think it also makes me think, too, is Ben and, can you can you consider now, especially with um, the role of the black press now, would you say that he's like the last or, or one of the last more, uh, would you say he's one of the more, uh, one of the last more well-known black, not only, not black journalists, but a black journalist who is writing in black institutional space. And, and yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, that's a brilliant point. And I think it is so important. Um, and I think Bennett, you know, Bennett towards the end of his career I can't remember he was receiving an award or something and he you know he was just saying I'm so you know I've never got a check from a white guy and that matters like it's you know for him that was such a point of pride like he took he always said you know I I write for the black press not because I have to but because I, I chose to and I think I, I don't I don't know if he's necessarily the last person but i think there is something to be said about and the ways in which um black scholars black artists black intellectuals moved into white spaces particularly post 1960s and the ways in which that maybe affected the type of audiences that they were able to reach or the kind of their core constituency in terms of who they're writing for um and I don't I don't necessarily think that's a you know exclusively negative phenomenon it's a very complex thing but I think there is a lot to be said for the power of black spaces and the power of black institutions in in providing people like Bennett with the space to write in the way that he is able to write and you know I think with Johnson Publishing specifically the past decade we've seen the dissolution of Johnson Publishing effectively as an institution um, and I think there are interesting spaces, um, particularly online for black journalism. Um, but a lot of those spaces aren't necessarily black controlled or they're subsidiary spaces. So places like the root or, um, yep. maybe the athletic, the athletic, you know, the yeah. athletic or, you know, things like that. I mean, there was a big kerfuffle a couple of years ago because Essence was briefly sold to a, I can't remember the specific company, but it was like a, a white owned company. And I, now I believe Essence is back under black control. But 
you know, those cards, they, those things do matter, I think. Um, and I think Bennett understood that very, very well. And I think also Johnson, you know, you can p- criticize Johnson, John Hayes Johnson, the publisher of, of Ebony, for all manner of things. But I think that's something that he understood very well. You know, the, the power that that has, you know, the, the power of owning black institutions and then having spaces within black institutions to write. Um, and yeah, I, it's, it's, yeah, it's a difficult one to answer. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, and, and and actually, for for those listeners who's probably what the fuck, what the hell, the 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 last. Hey, hey, let me let me let me let me back up real quick. Not the last, you know, not the last. But but I think that there was something singular about that moment, and also um, about Bennett Jr. So not to say he's the last, but um, he definitely is. Um, a, I think a singular figure because of the fact that going back to the consumerism aspect, although the tensions were there, some may say that the consumerism aspect that helped to develop the readership is directly in hand, hand in hand with it. So the consumerism and the more black militant um, historiography that he's, that John, uh, that not Johnson, but Ben and Jr. is writing in, they they work together hand in hand as opposed to being, you know, separate entities in the same building, um, you know, and, and it just makes me think. So you have, um, you know, a lot of in you. you I, I think for me, just trying to think about when I was a kid growing up in the in the late nineties and and throughout the two thousands, every spring on C span they would have the um, was it the Covenant with Black America discussions that that were always every spring, and they that is an archive in and of itself because I think that th- is and that's where I saw Bennett Jr. just talking, um, and I think he was actually in Virginia when they hosted the this like it was um um is it maybe two thousand and seven it was something to do with Jamestown maybe um and so and and it was kind of like a precursor to sixteen nineteen um. And I think those are important moments because you don't see this now. We ain't even talking about COVID. When you have folks like uh, Julian Malvo, Michael Eric Dyson, Cornell West, uh, Louis Fer- you know, uh, Farrakhan, you know, and, and and you know all these people under the same on the same panels, James Cone, you know, uh, uh, Dorothy Height, like like all of these black luminaries and intellectuals all in the same space. And so it just, you know, I, I didn't realize as a kid, because, you know, I'm a kid, I don't know everything that's going on, but it's just, you know, I, I'm not like a someone who was always like, man, I wish I could go back. I'm good. I, I like it here. Um, it's just one where, you know, you just kind of wish that you can have so many different views within black America, within, you know, black institutional spaces all coming under one roof. Um, and, it, and it's just, it's sad, you know, at least for me, um, it, it's a sad reality. Um, but, you know, the, the more days that we live, the more opportunities we have to, to, to build for the, for the future. And so um, got to do what you got to do. So, man, I appreciate you. And, and one of the last questions I got for you, flipping the script and talking about excitement. What excites you most about the work you do as a writer and a professor? Yeah, um, I think I, I like stories. I like telling stories. I like interesting characters. I like, you know, thinking about how people work and interact within certain spaces or certain institutions. So I think it's not a coincidence that so much of the work that I have done in this book and in other books organizes around Johnson Publishing. Uh, just because I feel it's such a interesting microclimate um, of, like you say, you have these different perspectives, you have different characters, you have different, um, you know, ideology ideologies or strategies, and I just I'm really attracted to those type of networks and, and milieus um, and the kind of characters and stories that emerge out of those spaces. So I think that's definitely um, the thing that that excites me the most, and uh, that's, yeah, that's probably. There's there's plenty of other spaces that 
you, you could look to for for those type of um, connections. But the the one for me that just turned out to be the one that I was really interested in was uh, was Johnson Publishing. Um, so yeah, so I'm I'm still I'm still just I'm still just writing about Johnson Publishing. I think. Hey man, look there. There's a lot of reason to do so. There is a lot of reason to do so, and um, you know I, I just think about for me one of the first. Um, I think it was, I think it was, it was was Ebony, um, when I was a kid, excuse me, when I was a kid, I remember actually, um, going to the Palm Beach County, um, public library and my cousin wanting to look at Ebony and literally going through the reels. Um, I was probably, I don't know, in the summertime. So I was probably like 11 or 12 and just kind of thinking about just like how cool damn, this is kind of cool. Not knowing that, you know, five, six years later, I would be getting an undergraduate degree in history. And then here we are, almost 100 episodes of New Books in African American Studies in, and we're doing more. Um, So, you know, and and this in this last question, I'm really um, interested to know what your thoughts are uh, before we close up shop. So as you know, folks who, who listen to the channel often know, I love asking my favorite historians and writers about their own workspace. And so for those who can't see, none of, you, none of y'all can see, only, only I can. Beautiful space. You know, got a nice window right there coming in, different work desks. Very beautiful. And so if money wasn't a thing, you got all the money, you know, just go to Ikea, get what you want. Big old spending spree. Unlimited. Unlimited. If you had all the money you needed to build your own writing, reading, and thinking space, where would it be? What would it look like? What would it smell like? What art would you get? And what is playing in the bu- in the background? Paint the picture for the people. Oh, man. I love this question, but I'm also very concerned that my answer is going to make me seem like a bit of a sociopath. Um, <laughs> because I'm someone who, like, doesn't... Like, I basically have to work in absolute silence. Um, to the extent that even sometimes I'll wear ear defenders because the tapping of the keyboard is really annoying me. So it's got to like a super, it's got to like a really extreme level. So there will be nothing happening in terms of sounds, I'm afraid. Um, in terms of what it looks like, um, I, I think about like my favorite spaces generally are botanical gardens or conservatories or that type of thing like if if you name if you ask me to name like one of my favorite places um i would probably say garfield park conservatory in chicago like that would be probably be one of the top places that i would say um just in terms of, of an environment so there would have to be a lot of greenery a lot of plants um and then yeah i it's a bit limited in the uk because you, you may or may not have heard, but the UK weather is pretty horrendous. So um, I'm <laughs> yeah, not sure about yeah, what yeah. this what this space is going to work like in the UK. But um, yeah, artwork. I mean, I don't know about specific artwork. Um, I have quite a lot of maps. I quite like maps. Um, so I think maybe there would be there would be maps around. Um, but yeah, I just I I don't know. I I know I appreciate people are different with this, and I know lots of people really like the energy of working in a cafe or you know that type of thing (laughs) i was gonna say that's a hell no for you if you say that 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 just sounds like so incredibly stressful to me so (laughs) i just i can't deal with that (laughs) at all um so yeah i you know more power to the people who 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 kind of get that energy from those type of environments but for me it has to be a i think quite a quite a regulated space probably um but yeah I, i love that question no, it, look, we were talking about uh, Lerone Bennett Jr. as a singular figure. You are one of one. I don't think I've ever had anyone in the history of me asking this question formally on the interview or in general, just like informally to say, complete silence. Like I've never, <laughs> never, ever, ever. So you are you are a one of one, James West, author of Ebony Magazine and Lerone Bennett Jr., popular black history and post-war America. It has been a pleasure seeing you, my friend. Um, you know, I feel like I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing seeing you uh, maybe in Montgomery um, in the fall for Asala. Let's hope and pray, please, Jesus, because I want to be 
back near my people, my Asala people. You know, we're doing AI chess this weekend. And so um, definitely looking forward to, um, you know, our, our amazing other organization, uh, Asala. And so, man, it has been a pleasure to, to see you once again and to talk about talk to you rather about this amazing book. And y'all, please support University of Illinois Press and, and buy this amazing book and, and support our authors. And so if you if you like this interview, if you're laughing, if you're enjoying this last hour, look, y'all, not all my interviews are two and a half hours. And so please enjoy uh, this interview. And, and if you did, please rate us and review us wherever you get your podcasts. And that's New Books in African-American Studies, a podcast channel, because I know Marshall is listening, on the New Books Network. And until next time, I'm your host, Adam McNeil. As I always say, over and